Honorable Speaker Jonathan Kofa, it's a pleasure to have you in this conversation with us Thank at uh, New Central TV. Thank you very much. Um, the first thing I would like to find out from you is um, we've spent a good few days in Liberia. Um, one of the conversations that I had was with a few young people who were very keen on talking about the war. Mm -hmm. Do you think the effect of the war has affected a lot of young people when you look at some of the things that the, the kind of life they're living currently? Oh, it's no question, definitely. If you look at the large number of youth on drugs, if you look at the large number of youth unemployed without any hope, you can trace directly those effects from the war. Um, while we develop the peace, there are certain things we didn't do well. We disarmed them. We didn't provide much support to get them to be rehabilitated. Uh, the UN came and did a makeshift program, and that was the end of it. And that's the effect you see. The youth on drugs, youth with no ability to, to earn a productive living, um, youth in the streets that is a direct consequence of what happened. So when you look at what you have done while you were deputy speaker mm -hmm. and what you hope to achieve as the speaker of um, the legislature now, do you think there are things that the current administration, the government, mm -hmm. will be doing to guarantee that a lot of these young people can see a future? Because from my conversation with them, they don't seem to see a future anywhere. Okay, so what we have to look forward to from the legislature, we take the president's agenda and we put it on the microscope and then we pass the budget, which is the fiscal tool for that. And we have background conversations and we think in that background conversations, we have to talk about youth empowerment. One of the things we, we, we think should happen is that there should be some money allocated to each district to deal with three major things, education, healthcare, and youth empowerment. If the government buys that idea, I think you will begin to see that some of the rehabilitation that needs to occur with youth will begin to occur. So when you look at education and youth empowerment, and you then think about the fact that poverty is a major issue, 51% of the population of mm -hmm. the nation they're below the poverty line, multidimensional kind of poverty. What in that kind of money, I don't know what amount you've approved for as a law now for the government to spend, what in that amount of money do you think will have any serious impact as a starting point for changing the hope and the future and the fight against poverty? Well, two things you need to do through the budget for youth. You need to be able to give them work and you need to be able to give them hope in terms of a productive uh, support system as a matter of a social safety net. One of the things government has to do, okay, in great times of stress is staying in the gap for what the private industry will do. So we need to get these youth uh, employed. They need to be able to do something that at the end of the month they take home something that gives them their own dignity, that this money that I'm spending is my money that I earned. Okay, when you do that, when you raise a man or a woman's dignity, you begin to give them hope for the future. And you give them an inspiration to begin to do things for themselves. So we need to move from that dependency, but to move from the dependency of either begging or drugs or whatever way they make a living, we need to provide a fiscal space for them to be able to do that. What amount it takes, I'm not sure, but you know, we have no choice but to develop within the interim a welfare state that takes care of their needs, and then we gradually we can turn them over to our private sector. So what kind of numbers? Uh, give us an idea of numbers in terms of budget that you think the government has put on the table that you think will at least scratch the surface or create an impact. Okay. So government has not put any numbers on the table yet because we just sent the budget back yesterday. We have said we think a million dollars per district, which are 73 districts in the country, 
um, maybe in the beginning a million dollars may be too much per district, but then we will have a negotiated way out to be able to discuss what you spend annually on the district, and that amount will increase yearly as we do the budget and in accordance with the, the, the revenue projections. So we're saying do 10% of the budget every year to go directly to the districts to have these kind of impacts. So when it comes to the issue of job creation, what are the things that you expect the government to do that will create jobs for a big number, sizable chunk of number of young people? Okay, so the reason why we broke it down to districts is because then lawmakers have oversight to be able to monitor how government money is spent. So we, we do private public partnerships. So we come to you in this district, maybe you own a printing press. How many persons you, can you afford to employ? Uh, you pr probably only five persons. We can tell you, say, look, can you create a second shift or a third shift and hire an addition of five? And those five persons will be paid through government support, okay? So you have five persons that are coming on to boost your business because now you can create an additional shift where you couldn't do it before. Your efficiency and productivity increase. So it helps you, it helps the youth who is employed with you and the government who's providing the support. If your business model increases, if your revenue increase, there will be at some point where you will be able to afford to take these people on, maybe three to five years down the road, where you will no longer need budgetary support for them. So when we develop that kind of model with the private sector, we will do well. Another thing we can do directly, uh, a few years ago, the Ellen Salif government created something called the Beach and Waterways Program. That was direct government support. And it, it, it hired thousands of youth, okay, just to do something simple, clean the beaches. Sometimes it's just about cleaning two to three miles of beachway in front of your house or in your neighborhood. And that was very effective. And I think uh, this government intends to, to, to keep it up but that employed a whole lot of youth and kept the beaches clean and, and livable and, and enjoyable. So these are the kinds of ideas you can use to bring a whole lot of youth under the ambit of productivity, hope, and vision for the future. Yeah, I love numbers and it helps to enable one to measure sure. and look at what you're doing and be able to put a marker down sure. that this is where you're going. So. Help me understand, in terms of a timeline, do you anticipate that in the next six years, uh, you will be able to wipe out 5%, uh, 10% of those below the poverty line and bring them out of poverty? What kind of numbers do you hope that your legislature, working well with the executive, will be able to get something that take at least the setting percentage and what percentage do you anticipate? Okay, so we anticipate if our vision of how the budget should perform, right, um, between half a million to a million dollars per district uh, on the average over the five years, over the six years, I'm sorry. We expect that there could be a corresponding reduction um, of five to 10%. Year on year or over a period of six years? Cumulatively. Yeah. Um, so um, when I was looking at the some of the numbers, it showed that the overall literacy, especially amongst uh, the males, the boys, mm -hmm. is about 48% those below uh, the literacy level mm -hmm. that you would expect, according to UNESCO. Mm -hmm. The girls seems to not be doing too badly. Uh, I can see 24%. Mm -hmm. What is it that you think we need to do? Because the people I spoke with seem to have more girls in certain areas in Monrovia than you have boys, and you begin to wonder, what is the level of education and what are you doing to guarantee that education becomes one key area that you use to lift people out of poverty. Okay, so as I said previously, the first thing we have to do is to ensure that the educational system has quality that will serve these needs, that will be able to educate these children, uh, these boys and girls. Oftentimes, people graduate from high school, they can barely read or write. Uh, so we need to fix that first. In fixing that, we need to make sure 
the cost of education, the cost of going to school, is one that the government has to bear. And there has to be, from, from, from first to maybe ninth grade, compulsory education. You know, people have to go to school. You can't find a child in the street hawking and just pass them by. You have to know why they are in the street hawking during school hours. You need to make those interventions, the Ministry of Gender and Social Protection, need to make those kind of interventions to ensure that these school-age children are in school. So that's the first step. Then next, you have to deal with how do you, once people have the correct education, how do they come out to, make, uh, to have a beneficial living? A lot of times, the reason why you see that affects boys more than girls is because oftentimes in this society, girls are more protected. So they have a little tendency to stay at home more, to be on a parental guidance more. Boys tend to get out earlier because they are for making a living to ensure that they too have a family, uh, to do, make sure that they too have uh, a livelihood. So when they do that, they tend to abandon education opportunities for some kind of work, oftentimes in the informal sector of the economy. Okay. Um, well, just before we wrap up, uh, because it's meant to be a very short conversation, sure. we don't want to take too much of your time. So I'm looking at the issue of girl children there are some of them who struggle in early life. So what is this government doing to ensure that this is an issue across Africa? Sure. The girl child don't get the level of support that is required. So you wonder, what is there a specific agenda that you have to help the girl child in Liberia? Okay, so about four years ago, we, we put in place um, domestic violence legislation, which is more than about just domestic violence. It's about how the home is managed to improve the, the possibility of success for girls, young children, especially female. We need to go into the implementation and support system stage of that legislation to ensure that we actually provide the support for our girls, children, in the home, outside of the home when they are in school, and in society at large. So the legislation is in place. We need to put the money to make sure it's implemented correctly. If we do that, you will find that the issues that girls have, as you say, all around Africa, will be minimized. We, we cannot ignore the fact that generally we are chauvinistic people, okay? And that's unfortunate. To break those barriers down will take time. That's why our government has to provide the support system necessary through the legislations we, we've, we've already passed into law, okay, that requires funding to do so. Okay, I spent um, about 20 years of my own life in the United Kingdom, and fortunately I can recall more than a handful of uh, people that I say are my Liberian friends in London. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to engage your diasporan librarians to come home to help? And is there anything specifically that they are doing now that you can point to and say, this is as a result of uh, the diasporans? Because in Nigeria, the numbers are unbelievably high in terms of funds that come through diaspora and Nigerians. Is that the same in Liberia? That's exactly the same. The, the transfers, from Liberians in the diaspora is astronomically high. There's a problem though, when you come to diaspora Liberians giving back, coming, to, coming back to Liberia to try to contribute. Very few people can afford that in terms of when you're making a transition in Western societies, oftentimes you still have mortgage, you still have car notes, you still have sometimes uh, kids tuition, and other things you have to maintain there, even as you are down in Liberia, trying to make a contribution. The salaries here are grossly inadequate to be able to do both in that transition. So the difficulty is, how do you get them home? During the Ellen Salif administration, the George Soros Foundation provided some of that gap. Unfortunately, it lasted for four years. So if we can provide that gap funding to be able to get them to come home, that would be excellent. 
But government by itself on the budget will be unable to do that because there are other competing priorities than getting diaspora librarians to come home. But that's a that's an excellent thing. You know, librarians in the diaspora got a wide range of talent. They've worked in these societies. They've acquired skills that we don't have, that we need. It's a question of making that transition. So um, for librarians who are in diaspora who are watching uh, our station, because we're on YouTube, uh, News Central sure. TV, and we're on all the social media platforms, and a lot of our diaspora and Africans, they do watch our channel. Sure. So what would you be saying to them in terms of hope for the future? One of the things we need to look at is protecting the economic space in the private sector in certain categories for Liberians to be able to allow diaspora and Liberians to transfer their knowledge base to Liberia in businesses. We need to create, we have, not create, but we have the Liberian Bank for Development and Investment that need to make loans available to Liberians from the diaspora who wants to come and transfer through business and other innovative ideas to come and contribute to their society. So it's a program that we need to develop. And there's legislation that I introduced um, four years ago that would cure that. It, it did not pass at the time. We will try to make sure it passes this term. I've got two short questions. Sure. And these are not my questions. These are questions that I got asked by young librarians. One of them was a young man that we interviewed at the church service mm -hmm. who was asked the question, uh, how do you feel about this government? He expressed himself and then he was asked, um, what hope do you have for the future in terms of this new government? For me, as a youth, what I hope to see is that he empowering the youth in, like, for example, I'm an electrical engineering student and you don't see more job opportunities for with the engineers in Liberia. That's why more people go out to go and get foreign engineers to come and do the job. So, in my own view, I, I hope that there will be a lot of opportunities for us, the young engineers coming up.